recent inaugural Dialogues on Race, which I hope will become a national conversation with in collaboration with a lot of folks. And I really want to thank the people who made this possible tonight. Uh, Central Track, which is part of University of uh, Texas at Dallas, and the Emory Family Foundation, who's helping fund this. And um, thank you uh, to all the panelists for being here, who I will introduce as we go through the program. Um, so my name is Janelle Engelstad, and I'm the director of Make Art With Purpose, the organization that started last summer uh, billboard and murals that explored issues and concerns connected to race. And this conversation tonight is growing out of that project and is sort of the next step. Um, so the mural and billboard program ad addresses a few different issues connected to ethnicity, to race, and it's sort of a smorgasbord of topics. So we're, it's, it's, a, it's gonna be a broader look tonight, but we can easily go deeply into one of these issues in the evening or a weekend or you know a program. But tonight, I just wanted to, to sort of present all these things and let people respond and, and talk about uh, what it is that they see and experience and see what has some traction, and then we can perhaps look at what next steps might be. Um, so the framework has been, this, this, the framework, framework for the discussion tonight is um, to move through these, the boards and the murals that were done in this program and then sort of move through each theme. And we're beginning with, um, and we have a, a projection issue, I'm sorry, so you're, this is, we're going to begin with this, this billboard up here and I'll um, explain it to you. Um, it was designed by um, Marsh and Alahari, who's here, joining us from San Francisco, and uh, myself. And it's very unusual for me to participate directly in a map project as an artist. I sort of see all of map as an extension and an expression of my creative practice. But this was a, um, a project that was very close to my heart, and it really felt important to me, and so I wanted to also have a more direct participation and help design one of the boards. So um, I'll let, I, I'm going to actually um, this, talk a little bit about this billboard because it's a little bit small up here. But this was a, we had three print billboards that were put up at different locations throughout the city. Each one had four different locations. And then we had one electronic design. And this electronic design um, is designed to look like the, um, an internet search engine. Right? So like the, the, the home page of an internet search engine. And if this would be where you would do your search, and it says in that bar, are people from the Middle East, if you would type that into search. And um, the different menu options that come up, often you get a guided menu option that tries to help you along to click on a link, is are people from the Middle East different skin colors, all in war, or all Muslims? And so, Marsh, and I'll sort of let you take it from here and um, talk a little bit about the, the inspiration for the design and et cetera. Yeah. Um, the apartment is project and the very candid presentation. So, I thought at first we'd give a short um, background about my work in general and then explain our thought process with Geneal and the development of, of this project. Um, so, as you mean, artists. Hang on just a minute, Marcia. We got a little feedback. You might want to turn down your volume just a tad on there. Thank you. Better now? Yes, much better. Thank you. So, as a new media artist and art activist in my work, um, I'm usually very interested in both the use of digital tools and technologies, um, as well as understanding how technology works and being able to analyze and critically. Um, think about the relationship between struggles in real world and the reflections online or in the visual world. Um, so with, with this project, Janelle and I thought it would be really interesting to find a way to present what people might think about race, Islam, and the Middle East by um, using real data. So um, we decided that search suggestions and search engines, as Janelle explained a little bit, are clever ways to talk about these stereotypes. Um, because as a lot of you uh, probably know, these suggestions and suggestions we can get um, on a search engine like Google are actually based in real searches by people. So um, it says a lot about a country or a culture and 
uh, what words were used the most when searching or um, asking a question about, um, in this case, the Middle East. Um, so we gathered a series of search solutions, mostly from Google and uh, DuckDuckGo, and uh, we both uh, looked at those searches from Dallas, and I looked at them from uh, San Francisco, and uh, kind of chose the ones that were, um, you know, at that point, the best, and created this billboard focusing on um, generalizations and stereotypes about what in the West or in the US people might think about the Middle East. Uh, but also, I think most importantly, hoping that after seeing these questions, people will go and search online to find um, answers that might be different than what they think about when they think about skin color, war, and religion in the Middle East. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and um, we also, part of kind of building into the fabric of this program tonight, um, have invited different community members and different and people who work professionally that connected to the different concerns that these um, billboards explore. So I'd like to introduce first Alia Salem, who is the um, executive director of the DF chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations. And um, uh, Leah and I met at the, um, the conference on race that was here uh, last um, November. No. Yes, and um, and we began a discussion and talked about the billboards and welcome and thank you um, for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. So I know that one of the things we talked about was this was this sort of this issue of stereotypes. <coughs> this this. Um, uh, the thing we were discovering in the search engines was something that you were really familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. It, immediately I connected to it because it's something I deal with the, these types of prejudices on a daily basis. And I don't know if anybody was watching the news over the weekend, but there was a big hullabaloo in Garland that really exacerbated the, the situation and brought it here to, you know, North Texas in a very vitriolic um, and personal way. Um, so when I saw this billboard for the first time, it made me think that if individuals could break out of this type of stereotyping, if they could see people for who they are instead of for what either the media portrays or for what um, you know different groups of individuals push as a narrative, and the Muslims, the Arabs, the you know different uh, backgrounds that this speaks to. Um, if they could start, you know, taking a bigger role in writing their own narratives, I think these search engines will change in their, you know, finishing of those sentences. And uh, what was really striking to me is if you go and type some of the stuff, that's actually what comes up, you know. Um, it finishes the sentences in these very um, shocking ways because you see what people are searching from the suggestions, that's what people mostly search for, are all Arabs terrorists, or all Muslims terrorists, or, you know, it's mostly terrorists. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the skin color and everything like that. So um, I had a conversation with one of my friends about the billboard, um, and we were discussing race as a man-made, you know, relatively new concept as opposed to ethnicity, nationality, et cetera. And it was really thought-provoking because it even brought me out of my own concept of what I understood about discussing race, discussing skin color, um, and, and these various stereotypes that we face on a daily basis. So I think that's where I immediately connected to, and more specifically, what is so often portrayed about um, Muslims and Arabs is that we're all one monolithic group, you know, that we're all this you know, one um, group of people that believe the same way, that dress the same way, that eat the same food, you know, and, and so on and so forth, have the same ideology, and it's just not true. Um, and, and that's not true for Arabs, and that's not true for Africans or Indonesians or Americans, you know, it's not true for any of us. And uh, they, one of my Jewish friends, she said, if you have uh, three Jews in the room, you're gonna have four opinions. And I, I totally identified with that because I was like, oh my god, that's exactly, I'm half Egyptian and I was like, oh, that's exactly, we'll get about 10 opinions actually. And we'll be there all night talking about it with hot tea, as long as it's hot tea, finished. Um, so I really identified with that because we're not monolithic at all. So 
hopefully writing that narrative and helping people to um, see the differences and the nuance. I think we've lost nuance in our world today. We only you know, have, have space in our brain for black and white. We only have space in our brain for this or that. We don't have space for any kind of nuance and any kind of um, detail that would differentiate people. So um, hopefully, and that's um, some of the work that we try to do in our organization with civil rights and advocacy is help people understand difference uh, in individuals and appreciate it. Thank you. I think um, <coughs> one thing that came to mind when you were talking earlier that I'm going to kind of come here, Marcia, so you can see me too. And before we sign off, I'd like you to, Marcia, we're doing this first because Marcia has another event tonight she has to go to. But one thing that, um, that we dealt with actually is we had, um, for the billboards, we had um, come up with much more derogatory content than what's here. And our first design that we presented to Clear Channel, they X'd because they felt it was too harsh. So this was actually much, much more mild. This, you know, our people from the Middle East, different skin colors, all in war, all the rest of it. It really, um, um, we, we used the, the sort of less radical ones um, be, um, because of the other part was censored. And, and, the, and there was a discussion with Clear Channel around that. Up the tollway, going 70 miles an hour and this, this thing's up for eight seconds and they're going to see this thing and they're, it's gonna, they're not going to translate what we were doing. And we actually kind of felt that might be okay. But Marsha, I'll let you kind of comment on that too. <laughs> yeah, it was a really interesting process because um, uh, we were talking about, um, as you were mentioning before, like the, one of the things that, for example, comes up constantly when you use these search engines is um, are all going to list your service? And that was in our, in our suggestion. And uh, you know, they asked us to take that out, or there were like some more radical ones. But you know, I mean, that itself um, is kind of censoring what's really happening in Western society against Muslim families terms and like taking that out. Um, so that, yeah, that was kind of like a really interesting moment because it showed to me that like, um, so it's not okay to talk about what's really happening because that might be too radical. Although people who are searching these things are searching these things in real life. And um, yeah, I mean, reading through, like one of the things that I always do is like this like, self-portrait thing that I always read through um, the comments on like articles that are about like Middle East or Iran or Islam and um, that that is always a really good way to understand what people think, think about like certain issues and uh, yeah I don't think you should censor that you should just let that be out there because it says a lot about our culture and that discussion happens so I think if actually the radical the more radical question we posted or like we, we first proposed would they would let it be there I think it would um, start very more interesting conversations. Um, yeah, I need to add on something. Let's just say hi to her real quick. Hi, Marcia. I need to put up. There's the camera. <laughs> um, just adding on to what she's saying, which is right on, um, with regards to the censoring, what I've noticed is it, it has become socially acceptable to, to say those derogatory things about Arabs, about Middle Easterners, about Muslims, in, in specific reference to advertising. And there have been, in, and, and Morshi can probably speak to this, in San Francisco, in New York, there have been some really inflammatory um, advertisements that have gone in subway stations and on buses that um, literally describe Muslims as being savages. And that you should choose um, the civilized man over the savage and saying that you know Muslims um, are savages and that's okay. But for us to call out something and say, are all Muslims terrorists, or all Arabs terrorists. That's too sensationalized, but it's okay to be very discriminatory in our verbiage in other forms of, or, you know, and Clear Channel has a huge reach, um, so I don't, I don't know, you know, um, the company that was behind those, but to see, you know, one, one uh, entity censor the way she said, and I agree, whether, I'm not saying it's not their right to have the savage, you know, um, advertisements, but to censor on the other end of it when we're making this dialogue pronounced and it's real life, and then we don't censor what happened in Garland, 
Like it just doesn't balance. And until we bring that balance back into focus, we're going to continue the cycle of violence and continue the cycle of ignorance. Great. Does anyone um, have any questions? Yes, Lauren. Can you and can you can, can, can you stand up and can you also just say your name before you speak, everyone? Can. Sure. I, I also, if someone is speaking or do you want to have a comment, just let's all be curious and not talk over each other. And uh, what happened in Garland? So I haven't heard. Um, so leading up to a um, a fundraiser that a Muslim organization was having, um, there was a right wing conservative blog that put out an article. Um, it was called, it's a, a site called Western Journalism. And it was a very inflammatory article that was saying that the speakers are um, masterminds behind the 90s um, attack on the World Trade Center and that uh, Muslims are trying to bring Sharia law into the United States and, and, and. And then it um, took off into calling Garland Independent School District who owns the facility where it was to try and get it shut down, even though Muslims have been having events at that for a number of years at that location, but all of a sudden because of this press and media um, hounding and, and mobilization for that matter, um, they like received about 500 phone calls and then it went viral and then Fox News picked it up nationally and then Bill O'Reilly had the guy on the show. So then it was like all hell broke loose after that. And our office got bombarded with phone calls and wanting media and blah, blah, blah. Well, then the, the, the people who were very anti-Islam, anti-Muslim, anti-this conference organized a hate rally um, outside the Garland Independent School District um, facility, the Curtis Colwell Center. And there were about 500 individuals that traveled all the way from Los Angeles uh, to come and protest, including Pamela Geller, who's one of the most preeminent, if I'm going to give her a title, it's going to be preeminent Islamophobe <laughs> um, in the country. Uh, so, so she works very hard to defame and attack Islam and Muslims. And uh, she graced us with her presence uh, at that event. So it was, and they had the, the Patriot riders on the bikes, and they were circling the Muslims that were out there in a love rally protest, a counter protest that was uh, filled with love and good spirits and, you know, reaching out to their neighbors. Um, so. It was one of the most, in my time, in my 35 years, it was one of the most hateful things I've ever seen. And it's not because it was addressed to people that I'm a part of. It was because of what they were saying um, and the way that they were attacking it and the vulgarity of it. Um, and, and then that, you know, it's not, that is not hate speech. That's free speech, according to them. Um, but in fact, it is hate speech and when they're attacking very specifically. So that's the gist of what happened. They were out there protesting all day and attacking people. Um, they punched one of our um, activists in the face and pulled a knife out on her. I mean, it was we got threats of dynamite. We got threats of people emptying their guns um, into the audience. So it was, it was really pretty, pretty hairy there for a minute. So that was why. I just, I just had a simple question. I just want to know if Clear Channel had a monopoly on the billboards. Because you said you went through Clear Channel, and I was yes. wondering if there were any other options. I'm, you, I'm sorry, Clear Channel has a monopoly on the billboards? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Clear Ch there, were, there are other options. There's Lamar and CBS, but um, yeah, Clear Channel definitely has, um, um, owns most of the billboard media in the United States and a lot in abroad, abroad too. Um, I actually, despite this where I talked about how they did some censoring, I found them actually, the, their um, public affairs person in the DFW area to be actually really open and worked really hard with us to get things by their their board that looks at billboards that go out. So um, I actually, um, was really pleased. I've, I've done billboard projects for 15 years and she was really one of the best. So. I read in um, a blog called Electronic Intifada which reported on this event that, that um, in addition to sort of the um, sort of ethnic re religious uh, stereotyping that um, that there was a group called uh, Christians United for Israel, which had actually galvanized a lot of Christian Zionists to go waving Israeli flags, saying that this sort of also 
using the stereotype that sort of Islam is necessarily associated with the Palestinian cause. Um, and so there, was, there were a lot of kind of um, Zionist politics that were at play at the, um, at the rally as well, at least according to Electronic Intifada. Oh, there were, according to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would, that's pitted, you know, I mean, this, the, to use that framework, uh, the pitting the you know Israeli Palestinian Islam thing against each other. I, mean, I feel like Christians use that often, or, or people use that often as a way to sort of um, make it a, a wedge between the community. That even the media inflames that often so much more than you know. The it, it definitely does here, and I'm sure Marcia can speak, um, especially on the West Coast, what they experience um, over there. But it definitely does here in the Bible Belt, right? A lot uh, of of times it's automatically tied in. And in fairness, on the Muslim side of things, on the Arab side of things, it's tied in from that perspective as people wanted to show up in their kafiyas and, you know, um, having a free Palestine chant or something like that. But it's, this wasn't about that. Um, so keeping that kind of separate, this is a separate issue, was also um, a difficult for some of the organizers to make sure that the message stayed on point and that we didn't devolve into a different protest um, than what, what we were there for, which was to express love. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, add oh, sorry, but it's someone talking? Yes, go ahead. All right, so I just wanted to add that, um, like one of the things that I was just thinking about is uh, in the last, I don't know, like 10 days, um, I've had a lot of discussions with um, many of my friends um, after, um, you know, what happened in Paris with, with the cartoons, right? Um, so there were like a lot of these questions about kind of like understanding these things in the context and you know like whether this is like this is kind of like is considered a hate speech or it is like racist in a way the cartoons you know, about the cartoons specifically and when it's okay and what is satire and whether if this was about like let's say like Jewish people it would definitely like how far they could go and whether it would be hate speech or not etc. So I think these are all um, yeah, things that we, we we need to talk about and consider, and it's something that I've been again like talking with a lot of my friends about that and, and how this could or couldn't be hate speech more than like freedom of speech. Um, so yeah, I thought that's something that you know that is interesting to continue having discussions about. Yes, right. Anybody else? Uh, Daryl Radcliffe. Um, my question is, did you have a, a response to the, the award itself, and so um, what, what was it? Well, this is, the, this is why these kinds of conversations are really important, because it's, there's no way to really measure people's response to a billboard. There's no system that Clear Channel measures success by how many people drive by. That's how they sell a billboard. That's how they... They, turn, they, they figure out their pricing. How many people drive by and in what social economic neighborhood is that drive by happening? So it, it never monitors anyone's reaction, right? So for me, this, this, this is the follow up. This is the, because I hear word of mouth. Someone says, oh, I saw this, or I saw this, or you know, like I said in the introduction to meeting Aliyah, that's, you know, that's how we wanted first things we talked about. This is this kind of conversation is what needs to happen to take that initial um, entry part of the project to the next step. If people saw it. <laughs> you know, I mean, and the other thing to just give you some background on how these space, you know, what happens is Clear Channel, this is this happens every time. They get so these these billboards were um, MAP is a nonprofit, so they were donated to MAP at PSA rate. So we, we were able to, to purchase the space um, at a, a discounted rate as a nonprofit. Um, and then they, give a, they gave me like um, 30 boards to choose from, maybe 40. And I drove around, took full, two full days to really drive around and look at the boards and think about, okay, which billboard makes sense where? How do we distribute these throughout the wider geographic area so that different communities um, are seeing these different ones, and, and so it's a process. Um, it's sort of curatorial in a way, really. Yes. Okay, Jonas. Um, 
I'm wondering about when you say you're choosing the billboards, that often the problem with a lot of these discussions is preaching to the converted. That right. probably there isn't anybody in this room, and maybe I'll find <laughs> differently, but there's probably everybody in this room is in agreement of right. certain you know, human rights and ethics. and you know. So did you choose the billboards in areas where people maybe are yes. more likely to be hateful? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And were there any complaints? Not from this project, but I've had it before. Actually, I did one project in Los Angeles where each billboard was um, funded by uh, a corporation or a nonprofit, and um, Neiman Marcus was one of the funders of the billboards, and it went in um, uh, North LA, kind of in the valley, was one of the billboards. And it was about gun violence. And a customer called the corporate office and threatened to not shop there anymore. And it was pretty like high profile customer. So I didn't do that anymore. I don't put the name of the funders on it so much. But yeah. And, and, I, and, and as we'll go through the evening, I hope there are people in here who actually disagree with some of these billboards. So those people who are here or have questions <coughs> surrounding them or feel like it can be interpreted more than one way. So I'm, I think we might hear from some of that tonight. Okay. Yes, Bella. Uh, One thing that strikes me is you were describing the environmental situation is how frequently people cling to free speech, which is an important thing that we cling to, but to counter that sometimes with freedom of religion, like there's not there's not a sign of a sort of a neutral body or maybe an artistic body that that sort of holds up that sign as well. So I just encourage you to pause that in the over conversation. It's one of those great American things that this nation is founded on. Is uh, a neutrality. Yeah. Right. Well, and it was interesting that they were trying to get the conference shut down, right. and their rally was called the Free Speech Rally. <laughs> so I was like, well, oh, that's ironic, you know, that they're trying to get free speech shut down and, and call themselves, you know, say it's okay for them to say what they're saying, um, when in actuality it's the reverse. They're trying to shut down free speech. Um, and, and it took a lot of the reporters off guard when, especially the, the conservative reporters from the GOP camp, um, off guard when I said, oh yeah, let them have their protest, bring it on, you know, free speech, God bless America, you know, and they didn't expect that. I said, that is what this country is founded upon, but it's also founded upon freedom of religion. And so to keep those two things um, at the forefront and keep them separate, uh, at the same time, keep you know religious issues separate from government issues, and then the groups that from the hate protest said, "Well, that's what we're protesting because you're having it at a building owned by a public uh, school facility, so a government owned facility." So that's that's how they started to spin it, even though it's a public facility and they don't discriminate against who comes and goes. Um, so that was very intelligent on their part, if there was anything intelligent about that situation. Um, was that they tried to frame it uh, as such, so it was just a back and forth of who's right, who's wrong. Great. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Go ahead. Go ahead, and then we're going to move on because we got a lot okay. of ground so to cover. So, like, I think um, you probably remember like what happened with um, Mona Al Zawi, right? With with the whole all the ads. Right. And, and so it was kind of the same, the same again conversation because um, so all there were all these ads that you were talking about in New York at the subways calling Muslims savage and uh, she went all to If you guys don't don't know her, she's like this like really famous journalist uh, from Egypt, and she uh, started like going to just like walking to a subway and, and using a paint spray to like paint on the, on these um, ads. And they arrested her in New York, and uh, she, like, her whole discussion was that, okay, so if this is freedom of speech, um, then why me painting on top of these are not freedom of speech? So I think all of these are, like, really complex, but at the same time, interesting conversations. Yes, it's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, everyone, for your thank comments. Thank you. And, um, um, We'll go ahead and you're welcome to stay with us as long as you can. I know you have an event, but we're going to move on to um, the next um, the next billboard in this series, which okay. is um, a billboard that um, was designed by um, Christopher Blay and Geraldo Robos. And um, 
I'm going to let um, them talk a little bit about the board itself and their process. And before they do, I'm, you know, I just kind of, because again, we have this smaller projection, um, explain the design, which is um, obviously some colored figures with their hands held up and then um, a, a fist that um, in, the, the, in the red stripes, it says Fruitville, Florida, and Ferguson. Uh, first of all, thank you, Danielle, for inviting me to the panel. And thank you guys for being here. Um, we had a sort of brainstorming process because it's the two things that um, are uh, sort of present themselves when you're working on a billboard is you realize that it's a sound bite, so you can't sort of uh, make it this thing that people are going to stand in front of and contemplate. It's going to be a drive by. You have a moment to sort of summarize the things that are important to you. So uh, we knew that it had to be a, sort of a graphic um, design oriented um, uh, presentation. And the first iteration was sort of a very kumbaya, you know, let's all get along, let's be cool. Um, but then in the in, in, in the moment of that sort of process, I think it was like over a series of weeks, um, uh, there was the, the, the case, the Eric Garner case in New York, and um, there's something else happening, and it just felt like there was a, this sort of moment of um, like accelerated violence against African American men, and um, so after talking with Dorado and Dorado and um, just kind of going through the process again, we ended up with this design. And the idea was to just sort of, uh, like all these, the Fs, the Ferguson Fruitvale Station in Oakland, California, and um, Florida with Trayvon Martin, we just thought that um, like the F represented like the the grade on the scorecard of race relations in America. It's like triple F. Yeah. Nothing's happening, nothing's working, and um, so that's where we were coming from. And uh, Gerardo has a strong background in painting, and uh, he can talk about how, you know, sort of arranging the, the specifics of the billboard happening. Yeah, and you know, once again, thank you for everyone being here and uh, being part of the discussion with us. I think the, um, the interesting part about the first billboard is that um, it was definitely a, a challenge because the first billboard was completely different than what we have now, that you see here right now. And uh, when Christopher came up with this design, uh, I knew right away that was it. Like, without a doubt, I knew that was the approach that we were going to go with. It was so much cleaner, uh, it stated something that was going on at the time that needed to be addressed. Uh, personal background, my, my brother is a police officer for, for Arlington, and so in that particular case, it, it was kind of really difficult to talk about it at home. Um, you know, we both are very, we both have different very opinions, and I always keep my brother in mind whenever it comes to any of these situations that come up. Um, so definitely, that definitely took it to a personal level. Um, and of course, my brother's a cop, so he doesn't have a cop mentality that they have to pr protect themselves and everything. Um, so of course we got into a lot of heated debates at home and you know among the family and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it comes down to um, not, it doesn't matter what skin tone you are, what ethnicity background, religion background you are. We're all people, uh, and that's what my personal body of work deals with is relating more on a human level. Uh, so whenever you see stuff like this that happens, um, uh, as an artist, I feel like, and I've always thought that my gift was art to be used as a medium of communication. And so pairing up with Christopher and coming up with his design was, was perfect. <laughs> you know, that's the way I, can, I could describe it as. But um, yeah, design-wise, uh, whenever we turned it over, uh, there was just really minor things that, that we played around with. At first, the figures were originally all white. Um, I went ahead and, and suggested skin tones that we see before that way. And the person that's driving by will see the billboard at least relate to it a little bit more versus just white figures. Um, which 
which was something that as soon as I turned it back around, I believe it was just a, a no-brainer at yeah. that point. And just talking about race and sort of a present and um, relevant way uh, that addresses issues that are happening right now immediately and uh, things that we don't talk about. And I, I think for me, working with this project was a way of saying that um, we don't want to sit around and talk about it anymore. We want to fix it. I mean, we have a really good group of people in here. And I think that um, we oftentimes wait until there's a tragedy. Um, we personally, I mean, we don't, we don't care enough, or we don't stand up enough, we don't stand up often enough um, when there are circumstances that sort of lead to people getting shot or people getting arrested. There's so many issues that we can confront. And I think if, I mean, my personal hope is that this is the absolute last panel on race ever and that we, we leave from here and go, seriously, and just go and uh, do something about the issues that are important to us. Um, if there are about 50 of us in here, if something comes up that's really important to all of us, instead of sitting at a panel, we can go all stand with, you know, confront the issue head on, because it's just, uh, I don't know, if I keep talking, I'll just get more pissed off. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just honestly just thinking out loud that I think it's important uh, to confront these issues uh, in whatever medium we work in or in whatever capacity we work in, whether it's in our immediate communities, whether it's as visual artists, whether it's musicians, uh, theater, other organizations. So. It was, I was really happy to um, be able to participate in the project, and I think it's, it's sort of, um, it sort of changed some of the trajectory of things that I've worked on previously, and um, yeah, so that's about it. My name is Daniel, and I have a question. So are you addressing um, race brutality in all races by putting all the colors? Or were you addressing only police brutality with respect to the other uh, mm -hmm. uh, of all the, those three cases? <laughs> well, for me personally, it was attacks on African Americans in the United States. And there's a history of that that goes beyond present day, you know. It's happened for probably as long as there's been cops and there's been African Americans. So I think it, it did need to be addressed, and that was specifically what I was thinking about. Well, I was kind of the opposite in a way. Um, I definitely, I mean, I agree with everything, of course. When I'm talking about the, the representation of the color and skin zones, I believe it needed to be addressed all across the board. Um, you know, growing up in, in, in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood, we do have like uh, surgical gangsters per se, that cops are always on them for no reason and stuff. And so, um, you know, it just doesn't stop just at, at African Americans, it's all across the board that reaches out. You may not hear about it on the news or anything like that, but like, you know, classic case is immigration. You know, that's a completely different thing, but you still have that mindset of, of, of Hispanics and uh, being mistreated by, by uh, immigration. So um, by adding the color, it definitely, uh, in my opinion, I needed it to be across the board. Especially if people would be driving by the, the billboard, they needed to be able to identify with it right away. Versus just like, um, you know, Jose driving by, like, oh, it's just the African American issue. I'm like, no, it's, it's an issue that everybody needs to face and talk about. So that was the goal with, with, with this project in mind, starting that dialogue, um, whether amongst friends, family, or just with strangers, and you know, being unified on that subject. I've been re-inspired in the last week by reading a, a letter that was written from jail um, by a man who's now very famous and recognized. And the most striking part of that letter Said, I'm most disappointed in 
looking like sort of like a good modern jupon. Jupon is what we need. And um, I love what you've suggested. And coming kind of dovetailing with like this, this very real thing that happened in the garden that I didn't even know about. Um, that there might be a collective opportunity here to when something's happening that we know is perhaps unjust, that there's just a call out to say, would you like to stand with me um, to make a statement in those who can, can but in, in, in real ways, you know, it can get so politicized and so sort of polarized. So we, I feel like even as I read the paper today regarding um, the recent kind of Texas legislative elections, um, that I, I just, I worry for my country, I worry for my state, for the things that I think that America is made noble by. And so I just would offer that one, if you haven't read the letter from Birmingham Jail recently, please do. And then uh, that there might be, a, I would love to sign up for this for the opportunity to make a stand and have another conversation to be a part of that. That's the front door. <laughs> the side of sheets out the front door. Good. Any other comments? Yeah, so this, I put this billboard, Christopher and Geraldo's billboard were, um, the, the I'm showing one of the locations, which is in um, uh, Southwest Dallas at the um, Veterans Affair, the Veterans Hall, the Veterans um, Foreign Wars like meeting center. So actually right here, what you see is a little billboard advertising their upcoming event. And in front of here is a veteran, it's a Vietnam Memorial um, with a cross, like, like kneeling down. So this was actually, did you guys happen, did you go by and see? Yeah, there was, I thought it was a really powerful place to have it. Um, their billboard was also over on Ross, um, kind of uh, between it's the, still there. it's still there? Yeah, so that's great. Some of them are still up because it means someone hasn't come in and rented them. And then their billboard was also, um, right on the other side of the bridge of Congress going into Oak Cliff. So those are the three locations for their billboard. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So did, they, did all of the billboards get the whole location? Yes. <coughs> they did. I have a I'm, I'm Rebecca Carter and I have a, like a thought observation. I didn't get to see all the billboards in their sites and I just really saw the billboards that I came across. I remember coming across your billboard. And uh, like, and I and I saw the one across from Trader Joe's, and I saw Jenkins and Tanya. Number one, it was like really exciting for me to see them. <laughs> like, oh my God, there it is! You know, like, there it is in the landscape, like this something different. Like, oh, it, but then what, I'm thinking about your billboard and the image, and then what this to me as someone who's interested in performance and dance and movement, and that this gesture, even though there's like a crook in the arms, this is like a gesture, like a universal sort of expression of joy. Mm -hmm. You know, to, like you put your hands up in the air, and it's like that's celebration. I mean, that's physical, but but then there's a little shift because there's like this group of the arms, and it's also like I surrender, you know, hands up, I surrender, and I'm not harmful. Great, right? like so. Yeah. Um, I I don't really even have anything else to say except for that's an important kind of like play that's going on just in the image of your billboard, and then maybe when we talk about our billboard, we would not have a conversation about the space of play and the relationship of that to this and to events. Yeah. You know, the real world events create a compression on sort of thinking about what this is about or could be about. Yeah, and yeah, hopefully there's a strong enough connection to what's happening now that um, that distinction isn't so uh, relevant, but um, with having eight seconds to look at a billboard, I think, and I hope that um, the message gets across, but sometimes it can be lost in translation. That's one of the um, sort of the things that you consider when working in a medium that you only have a limited amount of time to express something. But what I'm saying isn't that it would be lost in the translation, but that there could be a complexity to what is being expressed. Uh, no, this for me was a very divert or direct and overt expression of like hands up, unarmed, don't shoot me. Hey, <clears throat> I don't know if was even taking place, but I saw the real So when it happened, you know, I'm driving down the street. And you know, I put it up the gas, and I'm like, oh my God, what is that? You know, and I 
I think I even circled back around to see what it was that I, you know, saw that it was about project and all of that. And for me, as an African American female, during this time, um, just like you were speaking about just kind of the, the fullness of what's happening culturally, and specific as an African American woman, I've never felt such darkness in, in this day and time. I know it from you know studying and we know what our ancestors went through, but to actually be in that place where you are walking in fear. You know, I have a son, I'm walking in fear. I so it, it presented something uh, different for the atmosphere. But when I saw this, it was a spark of light for me that, oh my God, somebody is doing something, someone is standing, somebody is you know, making making a, a stand towards it. And so as just, I, I feel like I am coming in as a lay person and telling you the, the, the reaction of a lay person, it brought just a little piece of light that there's a billboard that's going to speak some truth about what people are experiencing. So I was very, very, very grateful that for the existence of I think that was uh, the goal was just to uh, really put that out there and, and take a stance, I guess you could say. You know, putting my name on there too, obviously, so that I'm taking a stance on this. But uh, just to show people that, you know, just, just because we're in Texas, these problems do exist everywhere. And, you know, we need to be leaders. Uh, we are leaders of our community and we have to stand up and, and you know, voice our opinions on this. So. Thank you for that. Thank you. So speaking of, if you remember, the one here um, was designed by um, Joe Ratcliffe and Rebecca Carter. Um, so all the artists who designed these billboards um, um, were invited, and they obviously worked together across racial or ethnic lines. So that they, the idea was that the conversation would start with them. So that the conversation happens at all these different levels. And that there's maybe even some sort of change or understanding or something develops between that initial connection between two people or the three of us, because I would meet with each team firsthand. And um, I'll let you guys talk a little bit about your design. Sure. Um, thank you again. And, um, so I guess uh, first uh, I'll, I'll talk about our process. And that it was really intentional, I think, uh, for me. It was as rewarding as the um, final design. I think we met probably three or four times before we even started talking about what the design was going to eventually be. Um, and, you know, just coming from you know, very different experiences um, was, was really rewarding. But with the design itself, um, I was thinking a lot about hashtags on Twitter. Um, I was thinking about um, whether or not almost almost sort of a, a, a litmus test or worship test of, um, of people reacting um, to a statement we are we are all black. Uh, that's you know, kind of putting blackness as a normative thing instead of um, kind of an outside thing. Um, and then also there was, so I was thinking about the different reactions. One, um, potentially a person like Jordy being like, no, uh, we are not all black. But I was also thinking um, potentially a black person also looking at saying no, we are not all black, and kind of uh, really the separation between um, race as a social construct and um, and what and what race is from um, you know and why race is a social construct essentially, um, and so I think all those things kind of came into play um, for me. And I'm not sure exactly what it was. 
Can you explain image. a little bit about the background to the billboard? Well, the, yeah, so, so I can't even remember how I first came, but this is an image that I, this is like a, actually sort of an idiosyncratic image from my childhood because my father's a scientist and he made these studies. These are, it's called a DNA fingerprint and it's a way of studying DNA. And what I also realized is like a very dated kind of imaging and that the imaging for, for DNA is much more complex now. I mean, it's like in the realm of like millions of pieces of data, whereas this is in the realm of maybe like, you know, in the 20s, 30s pieces of data. So that's, so anybody who knows it would know that this is like a super dated, like from the 70s. So that's kind of very interesting. And then number two, like the fact is that we, gene okay, genetically, this is maybe not so important in some sense, but also really important, I think fundamentally essential. 99.9% of our DNA is almost exactly the same. And that it's like this 0.1% of our DNA that creates this fingerprint that creates this, the difference that makes personality, skin color, hair color, um, you know, literally our fingerprints, you know, the, all the different characteristics that make us different. So that's a, uh, kind of an interesting sort of like ratio of similarity versus difference. Um, so, And then I think to, to me, and for in our conversation, this, we had this discussion about what does that mean, this idea of blackness, and that the idea of blackness is totally, it's this, it is a co complete construct. Like the idea of blackness is, it's not something that, that is created for certain kinds of political reasons and it comes out in a certain, a certain time. And, um, so that's, um, and yet it has meaning, and yet it doesn't have meaning. It's like this complex kind of uh, yeah. thing. And I think what was exciting is yesterday we were having this discussion, and, and Daryl was saying to me, you know, I feel like I maybe wouldn't have gone to this board if, because we kind of finished, we kind of were done a little bit early in the process, and then many more things were happening. Daryl said, I, I maybe wouldn't have gone to this in the light of everything else that has happened. And and then we were talking about that, and we were talking about what happened, you know, this idea of play, expression, how that becomes so unimportant. It becomes like sort of squashed down when you're dealing with like physical safety or, um, and, I, and I think that it's true, it is true that there's a, um, there's some visceral stuff that changes how we can uh, be, you know, when you have different kinds of things that happen and change the way that we, have access to these parts of ourselves and be in parts of ourselves. And it happens on a day to day basis and it happens culturally and it happens on you know, a larger scale. So that was, a, I think, an interesting conversation. And I do feel the last thing I'll add is with the We Are All Black, that's also referencing um, to the fact that humanity, as far as can be told, um, originated in Africa. Which makes me actually wanted to ask you a question. What was your choice in, uh, of your decision? Because I've, you know, heard that you may have heard that statement. What was your choice to use the word black versus black? So we are all African versus we are all black. I think it had to do with this idea of the construct, mm -hmm. the, the sort of irrationality of, of creating an idea of what black is. Versus African has a sort of location. Right, black doesn't have a location. It, yeah, no, yeah, I, I think it was to aid in um, having duality of meaning. I said I think it was to aid in having duality of meaning. Um, and I think also personally, um, that, is, that is the word that um, I, I choose to use. Right, the idea of blackness is not the same as the idea of original man being African, 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 sure. Absolutely. Anybody else? Where is it located? So this billboard right here is right over, was across the way here, right in front of Baylor Hospital in Maine. Um, and what was the car? It was Anyway, made by my brewery's coffee shop. They also there was also a billboard on um, 
down by by the design district um, <coughs> off of um, uh, Bolon and whatever they're calling Herbie. it. Herbie, yeah. And then um, the third one was also on Ross. Didn't you have yours as well? No. Uh, Press so. and then Forest. Right. Forest, yes. Yeah, or Forest. Yeah, Finwood and Forest. Kind of by Love Field. Yes, no. Um, just something uh, that I noticed in, in both both of the, the Lansfield works um, is that this this uh, notion of um, uh, kind of kind of multiculturalism was at play, at least in the process. You know, sort of the, the notion of we are on the you know ninety nine point something percent. It's this it's this notion of like you know at, at base we are all equal. Um, and there's this tiny thing that is related to a sense of power. And also, like Christopher, you brought this up earlier, that in an earlier version that there was this kind of um, we are the world right. aspect right. To, <laughs> to the project. And um, uh, so I, I just noticed that those two things had been a part of the process. Um, well, not obviously exclusively, you know, exclusively the dominant mode. Um, but then this other thing that Christopher brought up was like, I hope that we're not going to be talking about something and instead doing something, right? And and at the same time, the the icon of like the hands up, don't shoot, was the icon in the media of activism, right? It was of being active as opposed to like telling a story about something, of being in the streets, um, and. So this is a question to y'all and, and kind of everybody. <laughs> like, I'm curious, why, um, why was it that there was, relative in scale, I know that there was some activism that occurred in, in the streets here in relationship to both Ferguson and the Eric Garner decisions, um, but, um, but to me it seems like a much lower level of protest in this city in the way that the streets were activated, the way that bodies existed in the streets, to, to protest something then, you know, on the scale in New York or, or in Ferguson, um, or in other places like Oakland. Um, so I wonder, you know, the, I, just to posit this, could some of that reason be the sort of false equality of multiculturalism that we believe here in Dallas as a myth? as rich a history of protests in Dallas, and that can be traced back, um, you know, several, several decades and uh, debated, but, but it's, it's, there's, there's not that like, you know, some places, you know, they wrong colored trash recycling bin and that's gonna be a protest, you know? So like that's, so, so I would say like first, historically there's a reason there. Um, second, I have a history of that there was a protest, you know, at all, like of when, when you know, CNN was scrolling, Dallas could be on the names of cities who were, you know, doing actions in that way. Um, and, but then, you know, I think to your other point, it's, it's true. I mean, I think there's, that's the tension between, um, you know, kind of the reality um, that you want Right, and but then the, the lived experience of Black lives, uh, which are often, you know, they, those are realities that we don't share. Alpha, you want to comment on that? Alpha is a long time South sure. Dallas civil rights and uh, yeah. community activist. Well, I participated in numerous uh, protests here in uh, the Dallas community, and uh, one of the things that, that I think, uh, one of the reasons that I think that. Uh, there was, a, but well, why there wasn't this, you know, big, huge, massive uh, protesting going on here in Dallas is, you know, this is the South. Dallas is a very cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan city. We're very um, conscious of image, and um, you know, I just don't think that uh, uh, people here. You know, just this whole conservative thing and image uh, is just a big lie, uh, as we all know. Uh, but 
I think that that's the, 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 the main reasons that a lot of uh, people, what I, what I found is that people, they, they feel certain things internally and, and we'll have these conversations privately, you know, in our little uh, circles or whatever, but, uh, you know, uh, as the old people would say, when the rubber meets the road, you're going to be by yourself. You know, so uh, it's always been just uh, a handful of real courageous folk who will get out there and, and do um, what needs to be done. I know when I heard the uh, decision uh, of Ferguson, I thought I was going to have a stroke. I was just so upset. <coughs> and um, I got on the phone and I immediately began to call um, my circle of activist friends and I, you know, I said, uh, y'all know what's, what's uh, uh, if anybody is planning any uh, um, protest or what have you, I said, because I got to get this energy out of me. I said, I don't want to go to jail. I was so angry and I'm 57 years old and you know, I've never been in any trouble or what have you with the law, but that just did something to me. Having studied, you know, our history and having been involved in a lot of activism here in the community, and um, I, I learned that there was going to be a protest at the uh, police headquarters, and uh, so uh, I was there. And I, I walked, I, I marched up and down the streets uh, with, with, um, with the people. And I noticed something, I was like, man, the majority of the people here in Dallas uh, who were out there uh, marching were young people. And um, a lot of the rallies uh, and protests that I've been involved in here in Dallas uh, over the last 30 years, a lot of those individuals were what we call the old heads, you know. Um, but participating in that march um, downtown, it, it, the energy, it was very, very different. And it gave me a lot of hope because I was like, golly, these are kids out here and they are not playing. And I looked at the racial makeup of the of participants, and it just it blew my mind to see uh, first and foremost all all of the young people, to see people from uh, uh, different uh, groups like the LGBT community, you know, uh, to see uh, some old heads. Uh, and to see a lot of white kids with very revolutionary signs, it just like kind of blew me away. I'm like, oh my God. You know, for me it was kind of like a dream come true. Uh, and I'm like, you know what, these kids today, they're not playing. They, and, and when they took to the street, to, to the freeway, now, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm 57. Uh, I didn't know that they were going to go out and, you know, and stop traffic on the freeway because uh, I got a little tired. My feet and, and my legs, they were kind of hurting me. Um, and I was with uh, someone else who was older and I knew she was tired and wanted to go home and everything. So I didn't know that the, that the uh, people, the masses had gone to and stopped, you know, uh, the traffic on the freeway until I got home and watched and I was watching television, and just this energy that I felt, I said, it's a brand new day today. And these youngsters are not playing, and they are willing to do some real serious ass kicking. Yeah. Even here in the city of Dallas. Just though, you know, amongst that, that, that little group of folk that showed up. And I just, yeah, I felt like as an elder, I felt a lot of hope. I'm like, okay, you know, uh, I, I can feel good about when I have to sit down and can no longer do this. To know that and to see all these young folk out there not playing, challenging the system. And I'm like, okay, Dallas, it's, it's only profit. 
So it's, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be something real serious happening here, and, and so that's what 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 I feel. But uh, and and those kids are not conservative; they're not scared. You know, they have good jobs, they have money, uh, and, and 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 they have gun power too. I hate to say it, but you know, they they have, they have the money to go and and. and I mean, I do believe in non-violence, don't get me wrong, but, you know, I'm, I believe, like what Malcolm X said, you know, by any means necessary. But that was the energy that I felt from those people. Well, and just to build on what she's saying, I think I've witnessed the exact same thing. I think historically, we have not been united. Those of us who are people of conscience um, have not really come together for each other's causes. And that's something that I see changing. At the, at the One Love Rally over the weekend, we had Muslims, we had Christians, we had atheists, we had Jews, we had anarchists, we had indigenous peoples groups, we had people from the LGBTQ community, we had everybody representing our entire community. And I think you're right, it is you know, the younger generation and they're not afraid. And they are radical in the best ways. Um, and they're not afraid to stand up. They're not afraid to challenge these pundits and these, you know, bobbleheads that get up there. And, uh, you know, I think it is a brand new day. I agree 100% because all of those protests I'm going to, mm -hmm. and it's not the same people. It's, right. There are some core groups, but it's building and the momentum is growing. And I think if we just keep on it, it's going to keep Right, going. and that was going to be my uh, observation is that, um, through your history of protesting, I, I feel that uh, your energy was a more sustained energy, uh, an energy that said, we're standing here and we're not going anywhere. And I see the energy of the people protesting, because I mean, I drove through that and um, I felt the same sort of like, upswelling of uh, emotion. Um, but I think the distinction needs to be made that uh, there needs to be a sustained presence for any kind of change to happen. Uh, it can't be like, you know, a selfie opportunity to say, yeah, I marched. It's like, I think what your history, and I didn't grow up in the US, um, but just from understanding just the history of protest in the U.S. period. Uh, this idea that uh, people didn't go home. People didn't go home and they didn't, uh, you know, they weren't afraid to be arrested. They weren't afraid of the dogs and the, the, the fire hoses. And it was sustained until something changed. And I hope that the energy that we're all observing about everyone coming together is a sustained energy, and I hope that everybody here, in whatever capacity uh, we're here, uh, sort of like add fuel to that energy, so that it is sustained, and that we do make concrete changes. And um, so, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Yeah, and um, as, as a young person who um, was uh, on the highway helping to shut it down. Um, I would just add that, like, you know, culture um, does play a very important role um, in, 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 in this movement, and I think is something that um, there's room for the creatives who are in Dallas to embrace that and to uh, step into it. I do feel strongly um, part of what Christopher was saying with the selfie. And that demonstrating is not enough. Like, one big demonstration is not enough. And I was taking on demonstrations from probably the age of eight, whether it's the poll tax riot or against um, the first Gulf War, or if it was in the noughties about, you know, um, uh, United States and England going to Iraq. Sometimes the demonstrations worked, you know, the riots in the 90s in Brixton, you know, did shed light on what was going on with police brutality, but the demonstrations on their own don't sustain. It has to be conversation, it has to be discussions in schools, you know, both for racism, sexism, homophobia, 
we need to bring it into a discussion that's outside of just the demonstrations. But the demonstrations, I think, are incredibly important. But on their own, they sometimes can fizzle away and be a media trick, you know, unfortunately. I don't, I don't know if other well, people agree with that. Point is why it's important to talk yeah. disagree about having another panel on my <laughs> so that's, yeah. like, that's part of it. And I, I feel like we're talking about this moment as if it's not already part of a lineage. I mean, if we talk about the civil rights movement, the people who were demonstrating don't represent the strategists that planned that. And if we talk about this moment, it's the same thing. We have these brilliant organizers, Black Youth Project, Dream Deferred, Black Lives Matters that are like literally like on national conference calls. I mean, it's fascinating if you listen to it, right? And so that I actually think the selfie activism generation and viral is actually really interesting because it's like a challenge. Like people are challenging you to ratchet up like, hey, we shut down the highway. We're gonna shut down the highway too, you know? And I feel like that's how it happened, like this viralness happen because people are kind of one-upping each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and there's a place for that, right? And, and those people aren't necessarily people that are strategizing and planning it, right? And so I just see a beautiful continuation. And if we speak in terms of Dallas, Dallas, we historically may have not had this like protest culture in the way that we think of other cities, but we've historically had a really beautiful culture of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And so that's been sort of the, the that's, if you ask the differences in Dallas, that's sort of where our lineage comes from, and that's how kind of things have gotten done. And what's exciting is to see like people not taking that road of like accommodation, negotiation, politeness as oppression. Like it's kind of nice to see that culture shifting a little bit. But but you know, we things have gotten done through that way, and that's another stra strategy. Thank you. Um, so, um, um, in addition to um, being a, a civil rights and a community um, organizer, Alpha also has uh, participated in the other uh, kind of half of this initial part of the project, which is uh, two community murals. Uh, the first one was done at um, Billy Day uh, Middle School, which is right over here um, uh, on the other side of Fair Park. And we actually have some of our young muralists here tonight. Um, we have um, Marie and Marco Johnson in the back, and I also there, and um, Sierra Witter and um, Jesse Smith. And so um, this is um, the muralists working together. The, the mural's actually inside the school, and it um, uh, was made to bring together um, Latino and African American youth uh, to work on the project over the summer. And I'm going to let Alpha talk a little bit about the mural um, and uh, what was uh, accomplished through it and how it kind of fits into this project. Uh, before I start, uh, I would also like to acknowledge um, two of my colleagues who were here tonight who um, also helped us. Uh, to recruit students for the project, and that's uh, Miss Shirley Whitted Atkins, who is our art teacher at uh, Billy Day Middle School, and Mr. Lance Williams, who is our uh, band uh, teacher slash uh, Mr. Go to and do everything at the school. <laughs> he also uh, he and Miss. Atkins uh, are also very instrumental in helping to uh, bring a lot of cultural and uh, uh, activities and events to the school. And we also have uh, Ms. Taylor, who uh, she uh, is a substitute teacher at our school, but she's also very committed and dedicated and uh, helps us uh, with our projects as well. I wrote down a lot of things because I have memory challenges. So <laughs> let me read to you all what I have uh, written. So the mural project, well, the title of the mural project is United We Stand, Divided We Fall. And um, the um, mural was created by African American and Hispanic students to show unity, cultural heritage, and pride. It was used to build on culture as a tool for change. 
It created an environment where the students could brainstorm, dialogue, conduct research, honor the ancestors, practice humanity, and build community. We had a total of eight students. Uh, uh, we had um, one male student who uh, he stuck with the project, uh, and unfortunately he wasn't able to uh, be here with us tonight. But with the students creating this mural, it was like uh, a sense of family. We have, we became uh, very close. The main, my main objective uh, with the students was to educate them and let them know that we as a people, particularly African Americans and Hispanics, that we do not have time to fight and riff with each other. Uh, and so we dialogued about how the system of oppression pits blacks and Hispanics uh, against each other. Uh, and, you know, some examples of that are like immigration issues. Um, the students learn that it's not only Hispanics that have to deal with uh, immigration issues. There are <coughs> Africans, uh, Europeans, uh, you know, all kind, kinds of people from all over the world that have to deal with uh, issues of uh, immigration. But uh, you don't hardly hear about that. You primarily hear about uh, Hispanics, you know, coming across or crossing the border uh, and things like that. So, you know, we, we, we dialogue about those issues. Um, from a historical perspective, the students, they learned about how African Americans and Hispanics share a history. And, um, for example, uh, the students, they learned how um, Hispanics aided and assisted uh, black slaves, uh, you know, during slavery. Now, you don't want to learn about that in school, you know, you know uh, and, and I let the students know that a lot of what I was teaching them, they would never be taught in a regular classroom. And that there were people, if they knew what I was teaching them, they would have run me up out of that school. I told those kids that I wanted them to know that, uh, that, that what we were doing was very serious. Uh, we also talked about the history of uh, blacks and Hispanics throughout the diaspora because you know, when you look at uh, the Caribbeans and, you know, Central America and whatever, there are a lot of black Spanish-speaking people uh, that live in those areas, and the students learn how that came about you know, uh, through the slave trade. Um, the students also learn about how the iconic figures in the mural were fighting for the same causes. And uh, the, there were four iconic figures in the mural. There was Martin Luther King Jr., Harriet Tubman, um, Dolores Huerta, and Mr. <coughs> Cesar Chavez. So the students, they conducted a lot of research. They researched each um, iconic figure, and um, we learned how um, they fought for similar causes, you know, uh, civil rights, justice, equality, decent housing, uh, all of those things. Um, they also learned how blacks and Hispanics use various forms of collect collective action as part of a nonviolent movement, uh, i.e. boycotts. You know, we talked about how Dr. King uh, and individuals involved in the civil rights movement used Boy, how they boycotted versus how Cesar Chavez and uh, Dolores Huerta organized boycotts for uh, farm workers. And, uh, and I asked the students, 
you know, can you tell me what is the difference between uh, a migrant worker and a slave? And I told them the difference is a piece of change, a little piece of money, you know. Um, so, you know, uh, they were just really surprised to learn about the common bonds and the commonalities uh, that blacks and Hispanics uh, have. We talked about um, how oppression is used to pit people of color against each other, like how you hear, um, and sometimes even in our homes, our family members say, the Mexicans, they taking our jobs. And I'll let the students know that's not true. I said, y'all tell me how many of your mama, or your dad, or even you want to work in a chicken factory and chopping off heads, chopping off chicken heads. I said, you know, but uh, 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 people who live in, let's say, Guatemala or El Salvador, who, whose country is war-torn and they don't have any jobs, will be more than happy, will feel like, you know, uh, it's a privilege to have a job working in a chicken factory. Now you go home and ask your mom or your dad if they want to work in a chicken factory and if they would fight. Do, will they, do they fight in Hispanics uh, to work in a chicken factory or what have you? And the answer is no. Because uh, your mom or your, your dad or family member will see that job as inferior. So we dialogue about those, those types of issues. Um, we, we, we talked about how does, uh, the system of oppression pits people of color, um, like when they say, well, them Mexicans, they all need to learn English. You know, I hear a lot of black people say that, and I ask the kids, do y'all hear people in your family, in your neighborhood, say things like that? I've even had to correct some of the kids at the school for saying things like that. And then I remind them that we, as African Americans, come from uh, people who uh, were brought here uh, against our will, but we spoke many languages. So you need to study your history so that you can know uh, who you are and where you come from, and that there was a time when, you know, we were, uh, we were not allowed to speak our native uh, languages and tongues. So the children were just, you know, they, y'all learned a lot, right, right, students? <laughs> <laughs> and um, also the students, they learned that um, during Jim Crow, Jim Crow just did not affect black people, it affected uh, uh, Hispanic people too. I had them to research um, uh, signs that says no dogs, no niggas, and no Mex no, no Mexicans. They were shocked. To, um, to see those types of, of signs. So it was just those types of uh, dialogues and experiences that we, you know, let the students know we do not have time and we cannot afford to, to fuss and fight with each other and to, to fight over the crumbs that uh, the system throws uh, 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 towards us or at us. And, um, at this time, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the uh, the figures that's in the uh, the mural from a cultural perspective. We have um, uh, two. Um, two of uh, the, the hearts, two Aztec hearts, and those hearts represent the flags of the colors of students who attend day who are from Central American countries like El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. Um, because it was very important to us to let all of our students um, at day feel that they were a part of that mural. We wanted the students to feel like when they walked up and down the hallway, when they looked at the mural, that they could feel a sense of identity. Um, we also have the Sankofa bird. We have two, two Sankofa birds, 
the same book, but reaching back into the past, we let the students know that it's important for you to understand where you come from so that you will know where you're going. If you don't know your, your past, uh, you're going to be lost uh, in, 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 in the future. And so the students, they can talk about that a, a, a little more uh, because I'm, I'm going to allow them to talk about what they uh, contributed uh, to the mural. Um, we also incorporated the Mexican flag and the black national flag. Uh, and in the center of uh, both of those flags are two hands shaken uh, that represent unity. Um, and the students, I'm going to allow them to explain uh, what the symbolism of the different uh, colors of um, the mural. Uh, now, the students, especially Sierra, Sierra, raise your hand. Okay. Sierra told me one day, she says, uh, Miss Thomas, you, you're driving us crazy because you tell us the same thing over and over every day. And I told her, I said, baby girl, there is a reason for my madness. Uh, the reason that I tell you all the same things every day is because I want to make sure that you all learn this information. Um, because this is, this is some, you all are making history history uh, with this mural. We let the students know that, that as long as the school exists, the mural will exist. Hopefully if we don't have uh, a principal to come in and decide that uh, he or she doesn't want to see that mural there anymore. Just make it happen. And we're going to do it again this year. Uh, and I'm trying to